and we'll start. Oh, sorry. We'll start uh, putting people on spotlight in a second. So we're recording this session. It will be uploaded on YouTube. So if you do not want your video, please um, keep it that way. Please try to keep your uh, microphone muted uh, so that we can listen to our speakers. Please use uh, hack our etherpad and chat to share questions, your idea, have your side chats. It's all uh, perfectly welcome for this particular session. I'm Malvika Sharan. I'm a co-lead of the Turing Way. This is our uh, July's Fireside Chat hosted by the Turing Way. A few words about the project itself. Uh, the Turing Way is an open source, open collaboration and community developed handbook on data science. Our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative research accessible and comprehensible for everyone. We represent an international community of researchers who create resources as chapters and community practices, bringing perspective from their own countries and backgrounds. This Fireside Chat series is an uh, effort towards creating a space where every burn can gather, exchange concerns, explore challenges, and share different practices that work in different contexts for them. Today, we're delighted to co-host this conversation with our very own Alicia Kral, uh, the director of the commu car community called the Carpentries, and she will introduce herself and the Carpentries in a moment. Please note that uh, we have a shared etherpad once again. We, we would really encourage you to take written notes so you can take it back with you, invite your ideas and links to share there, and also you can add questions so we can keep an eye on that. We have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. For any concerns reporting of an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call or any idea for further improvement for accessibility, please email the turingway at gmail.com. You can also directly reach out to me by emailing msharan at turing.ac.uk. With that, I'm very happy to hand it over to Anne Lee Steele, a community manager of the Turing Way, to kick off this session. Cool. Thank you so much, Malvika. Um, as you've been hearing me over the course of the past couple of minutes, welcome to our July fireside chat. Um, my name is Anne Lee Steele, and I'm the community manager of the Turing Way. And we'll be bringing perspectives and questions and learnings from our community to this conversation. But most importantly, I'm really excited to engage with the speakers and with you all in the audience um, today on this really important topic. Um, this topic around navigating scale and growth emerged out of a conversation with Alicia Kroll of the Carpentries as we began to discuss shared concerns and questions within our two respective communities. And the digital first nature of a lot of our projects has meant that communities have been able to grow really quickly and across borders and in ways that were never previously possible. But of course, with this increased scale have emerged challenges of different kinds around sustainability, around inclusion, around governance and maintenance. And the more we spoke, the more we realized how applicable the, these concerns were for many others in the open ecosystem more broadly within communities of open science, open education, open data, open source software, and many, many others. And so we wanted to create a space today to talk about our projects, to share questions and challenges and trade-offs that come with this notion of scaling communities, and to ask how people have worked to address them. Um, we encourage you all also in the audience today should, to share your questions and your experiences with us, either in the pad or in the chat. Um, I'm so delighted to be joined today by speakers who have a really wide range of experiences and expertise on this topic. Um, I'll definitely leave it to them to tell you more about themselves, uh, but I will add that I'm personally really excited to bring together this intersection of people having learned a lot from the open geo and open knowledge communities before joining the Turing Way, and most recently having joined open science and open scholarship by virtue of my role here, learned a lot from these communities as well. All of this, of course, tying back to open source software communities also. We'll be begin with a short round of introductions of around two minutes each to kick us off, where you can share the angle through which you'll be discussing this notion of scale and growth. Alicia will introduce herself and the Carpentries first, followed by Joffrey, Patrick, and Sele response, uh, respectively. And a small reminder to those tuning in, don't forget to use the Zoom chat or the etherpad to write notes or to ask questions, and we'll take note of them for our speakers here. 
um, and speakers, if you'd like to respond to each other's questions or comments throughout our conversation today, I just encourage you to use the raised hand function, um, which is on the bottom right hand side of your screen within the reactions panel. Um, but that's all from me. I'll pass it on to Alicia. So thanks so much, Anne. Um, my name is Alicia Crawl, and I am um, the Director of Community for the Carpentries. Um, I saw that Carrie Jordan, our Executive Director, is on the call. So Carrie, could you put a um, URL for, I guess, the Carpentries into the chat? Um, but I'm going to start with talking a little bit about the Carpentries and then transition into why I'm here today to represent our organization um, as it relates to today's topic of scaling community. Uh, so the Carpentries teaches foundational computational and data science skills to learners through workshops, which are taught by um, our certified instructors. Um, so since 2012, uh, more than 3,400 instructors have taught more than 3,000 workshops in 64 countries. Um, if you are interested in learning more about us, we'll, we will be um, hosting our biannual conference. It's starting actually Monday of next week. Um, registration is free and the event is fully online. Line. Um, there's programming across time zones, so you should be able to find one or two sessions of interest no matter where you are located in the world, but there are a few sessions that are relevant to this audience. Um, I'm going to be talking about this a little bit more later, but there are actually going to be three resource development sprints um, for co-developing a handbook around community coordinators for the Carpentries community. Um, there are going to be two panels of um, community coordinators um, where you can hear from them um, how uh, they have been supporting their roles. You can ask questions and engage in that conversation a little bit more. And there's also an informal meetup on building um, a Carpentries community. And so I'm going to add a link here into the chat with the schedule um, for the event where you can find out a little bit more. Um, but I have been in my role as the Director of Community for just over a year now. Um, when I first started my job, I was tasked with developing a program to build capacity and community management across all of our different sub-communities. So we're a global community, and over time, um, many local, regional, and domain-specific sub-communities have emerged. Um, at the same time, individuals have emerged as leaders of these sub-communities with no real guidance from our organization on how to do that effectively. So in January of this year, um, we started the community development program um, to support our community members who are serving um, in these, uh, what we're currently calling as kind of community coordinator roles. So our biggest challenge is trying to develop a program and related resources to support sub-communities that are different in so many ways. So their size, the resources they have available to them, their culture. Um, so we are also getting almost um, weekly Weekly request uh, for support from individuals who are also looking for guidance on how to create a new subcommunity. So how do we develop this program and the related resources in a way that can be valuable to all these groups? There's no one size fits all guidebook or governance structure that will work for everyone. So I'm here today so you can all answer that question for me. Um, but I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jeffrey now. Great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alicia. So uh, my name is, is Jeffrey uh, Trega. I work with the uh, humanitarian open stream up team um, at our regional hub for Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, where I work as the uh, community manager. Uh, but I also belong to um, several uh, open communities. I belong to the, uh, the open the smart community in Uganda. Um, I'm also with Median. Um, I'm also part of uh, OpenStreetMap Africa, which is uh, a network of uh, awesome communities um, in, in different countries in Africa. So I've been uh, involved with communities for uh, a long time now, and um, I'm, I'm happy that where I work now uh, with the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, um, I do work out with communities and also helping them to grow. Uh, but when uh, and what I would like to really discuss today um, as we chat is uh, around sustainability. Um, I think when it comes to scaling communities, uh, sustainability is key because um, setting up a community is, is, is easy, it is simple, but keeping it running and also uh, making sure people can participate um, within the community um, 
talking about like diversity, uh, but also governance to make sure there is like a strong leadership within uh, the community to help it uh, grow, uh, to um, mobilize resources, uh, to support the community members in different ways. Uh, I think that all kind of uh, important aspects and uh, yeah, sustainability uh, really is, is key uh, when, when scaling uh, communities. Um, yeah, and then hand it over to uh, Sally. I think it's Patrick now, though. Uh, Patrick, over to you. No problem. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, so I'm uh, Patrick Minot. Uh, I am a uh, neurotechnologist, um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about my involvement with uh, Neuromatch Academy. So Neuromatch Academy is an open science, uh, open education effort. Um, to teach uh, students from, from all around the world, uh, computational neuroscience, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, maybe other subjects in the, in the near future. Um, so when I got involved in uh, Neuromatch Academy, we were uh, eight people that just had an idea, and uh, you know we that we didn't quite know whether it was going to uh, to work or find product market fit or if, if anybody cared. And uh, pretty soon, within three months, we had to produce enough materials for a three-week full course uh, for 1,700 students with 200 TAs across more than 60 countries and territories. Um, and in the end, we ended up, uh, I believe, about 300 volunteers. Um, so that kind of hyper-growth, hyper-inflation <laughs> uh, situation, uh, you know, created a lot of, of, of uh, interesting situations, friction, uh, and lots of uh, nice friendships, which uh, continue to this day. Uh, so I'd love to talk about uh, that experience of, of building up something from scratch and, and creating culture de novo. Thank you. Hola a todos. I'm Sele. Um, I've been part of the open source community for a while now. We were discussing about, <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. It's been I don't know, six two thousand and six or something, that I've been part of this. Um, I'm a co-founder and coordinator of the initiative called Geo Chicas, which is a women's and women and non-binary people um, mappers group in OpenStreetMap, where we work around the role, participation, and representation of women and non-binary people in the OpenStreetMap community. Um, we started off, I think it was already five years ago, and we were only like. I don't know, five people. And now we're almost 300 around, I think, 32 different countries, which is amazing. Um, so really excited to talk a little bit about scalability on the communities because it's such a challenge. And it's something that, as Alicia said, we, we have the idea, we spark the idea, but we don't necessarily have the manual <laughs> to conduct that idea or to actually make it the best way we could. So pretty excited to learn more about other people's experiences as well. And full disclosure, I'm not part of, like I'm not a tech person. I come from social sciences, um, but I'm here and I'm always excited to talk about open tech and open education and open knowledge. Well, I'm also part of, sorry, the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, but I'm here representing Geo Chicas right now. I'm a global diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist in the Wikimedia Foundation right now. Thank you. We're so excited to have you all together. I mean, it's amazing to hear about even just the beginnings of the vast amount of experiences and very different spaces. And we hope that maybe over the course of the next hour, we can solve all of the issues that we've introduced uh, during our introductions, or at least just begin the conversation in that direction. Um, I guess I'll, I'll kick us off with a very general question um, to really ask you all, you know, what challenging, what challenges has scaling posed for your communities that you're part of, for the projects that you've built, um, the courses that you've shared, um, the organizations that you've started? And maybe I'll pass this first one on to, to Patrick to get us started. Uh, yes, I see in the uh, the notes here that uh, you know one of the bullet points is potentially like rapid growth and how do you maintain a community when you have such uh, rapid growth? 
uh, yeah, that's definitely something that, uh, that we experience. Um, you know, at the peak of, of our experience with Neuromatch Academy, we were onboarding uh, maybe like 10 volunteers into the Slack every day, right? And, um, and, you know, maybe you had a doubling of the effective volunteer size every week, two weeks, something like that. Uh, so how do you maintain, like, how do you say, like, this is our culture, like, this is how we do things here, and this is not how we do things. Um, so I had a, an early discussion, which was really, really um, useful with uh, a contributor to the Carpentries and to uh, Jupiter and Jupiter Book and, and uh, many other projects uh, whose name uh, is uh, Elizabeth Dupuy. So she, when I told her, you know, we were uh, experiencing this, like how, how am I going to, how do we maintain the, uh, the integrity of this like rocket ship that we're on? Uh, first thing that she said to me is, do, do you guys have a code of conduct? Uh, and I was like, oh, uh, yeah, I guess we could like make one. But we had like so many things like, going on at the same time. You know, we had like students like knocking on our door that it didn't seem like a like a huge priority. But of course, you know, as we grew and grew, we had to create that culture. And she pointed me towards a, uh, a talk by the creator of Elm. I forget his, uh, his name, uh, but it's about how we can build. And so if someone in the audience can go find this, uh, this talk and, and post the link here, I would really appreciate it. Uh, but the talk was, uh, was really quite uh, interesting. And it's that culture just doesn't happen. You know, it's, uh, it happens because people take the time uh, to create it and, uh, and say to people like, these are the values of our communities. Let's all agree that these things are cool. This is not cool. This is how we make decisions. This is not how you talk to people. And, uh, and if you, you know, reach beyond this boundary, then you're out. Um, and I think that that was a very uh, important early decision, maybe in the first month that we experienced this, this hyper growth, uh, to have a code of conduct, to, you know, make sure that everybody knew what um, the, uh, the boundaries of, of the community are. And um, so that we could all, you know, interchange and, and, and exchange in a, in a respectful and sustainable manner. My immediate reaction when I heard of you talking about uh, onboarding people into Slack was thinking about how greed, Greedbot is being deprecated in August and how difficult that onboarding process would be. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that is, uh, that is scary, but I found that, you know, so on a very different kind of, uh, of topic that uh, having like nice bots and stuff to include people into your community is great, but having events that can take those people that are greeted to the community and are onboarded and have them assign a task just increases your, your retention by this huge number. Otherwise, people get lost, and even if they have Greedbot, you know, they, they get lost in the Slack. I mean, we had, I think at the peak, we had 4,000 messages a day. I mean, it's more than any human should and could see. Uh, it's too much. How's it been for you all, Joffrey and Tele? I know that the act of one creating a, a code of conduct within the OpenStreetMap community is very much been a working in progress, but also um, the the challenges of, for example, growing GeoChicos. I, I know that Gisela have talked about how quickly it's grown across uh, many different countries and many different communities. I think that pinging back to the creating a universe, like a code of conduct. This is something that in, in the Wikimedia movement is actually going through. It's creating a universal code of conduct, which is a huge endeavor. Um, but I think that whenever a community, a group or set of people um, talk about creating a code of conduct or rules of engagement or whatever you want to call it, or like um, friendly spaces, policies. The problem is the backlash that we some that we usually get <laughs> because when practicing inconvenience, um, the people who are already there and the ones that are setting the tones and the rules do not want to be inconvenient by something like a code of conduct. So I think that for groups like Geo Chicas, who are some sort of like, I hate doing this, but like a minority within the community, it's complicated to move along those kind of projects because we get a lot of backlash. 
And it's like, why would you want a code of conduct? Well, because just by the mere fact that you're asking, if we, why do we need it? It's just a clear answer to, to that, like we need that. And I think that that has given us, and not only Geo Chicas, but I know also there are working groups in the open stream of community that are also pushing to have a, a code of conduct is that you, instead of finding allies, you start getting enemies. And it's complicated. I think it's really complicated. And the inconvenient someone part is something that you actually need to say, like, I'm willing to take on this battle because it takes a lot of you. And it could be pretty draining. <laughs> Sorry for the noise. It, could, it can be pretty draining for you to actually like move forward with something like a code of conduct. I don't know, Jeffrey, if you have something to say about what's happening in the OpenStreetMap community, Chan Chang. <laughs> yes, definitely. I, I think um, in, in the OpenStreetMap, because the OpenStreetMap community is also a community of communities. Um, like Selin has said, they are like different um, uh, groups within the, the OpenStreetMap community. And um, yeah, when it comes to, um, you know, getting the code of conduct uh, just also making sure that the it aligns with the different groups um, is, is also very important but also making sure that the kind of unheard or quiet voices are also represented um, and, and this is always evident when it comes to even enforcing the um, the code of conduct you know uh, yeah when someone kind of violates the code of conduct how do you even uh, navigate uh, you know, being on the same page that yeah, this is um, this is what is in our code of conduct, and this is what we should follow, and also making sure that it kind of um, represents uh, people with different uh, backgrounds. Because uh, yeah, without considering that, like um, if it's kind of a global community, um, it also has, has like uh, people have different kind of cultural backgrounds. Um, what is you know, right for someone uh, in Uganda may not be right for someone um, living in another place of the world. So um, I think that's like for me the, the, the kind of thing, like how do you balance uh, uh, and have a code of conduct that talks to um, people with uh, uh, different kinds of backgrounds uh, uh, within a global community, yeah. I can rest. Oh, Sorry, Alicia, go for it. No, no, go ahead, Anna. I, I was just, I was gonna um, answer too before transitioning, I guess, to our next question, but go ahead. I was actually just about to ask what you were thinking about this as well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, some, I guess some similar comments to others, um, you know, I mentioned that we're developing this new program this year, and a lot of the development of that program was um, informed by uh, interviews um, that we had with sub-community members within our organization. Um, however, a lot of those sub-community members that we talk to um, are those that are very visible right now in our community. Um, we've grown so rapidly, we actually don't know what all the sub communities are, who the leaders are of those sub communities. And so um, we're really looking at how do we, um, you know, not only inform this program with those individuals that are very visible within the community, but um, others as well. And what does that look like? And again, I think similar challenges to what Jeffrey mentioned, um, you know, it's very different what a program might look like could look very different um, in Africa than it would look in um, South America. And so you can't kind of just build a one size fits all program and then everyone has their little manual and they follow the guidebook and then they're off and running and all as well. Um, and so there's just those complex challenges. So building something that has that flexibility um, and what does that exactly look like? And I, I think with the conversations we've been having over the um, past week have really shown that I think it's something we're all struggling with a little bit. Um, 
But I will, um, I guess, transition us to our next question. Um, so what tactics or tools have you applied to make that scaling that you have been doing with your communities more equitable? And um, I'll call on you, Saley, to answer that first. I don't know if we have actually like implemented tools per se to support the growth of the community. What we've done is have like honest dialogues to try to understand what could serve to some groups and what could serve to others. Like for example, at some point we're saying, okay, we should all have a Slack. And a lot of people were like, well, I don't even know. This was before the pandemic, right? Like a lot of people weren't using Slack at that time. And we were like, ah, no, let's just use Telegram. So at some point we were like, okay, so we got this that works to this extent, or we can go to this other side of things. But a lot of people who are part of the open source world do not want to be part of Slack. So it's always a constant dialogue. And I think like the best tool on growing a community is to have honest dialogues, like debating, amazing, dialoguing, even better. So also understanding a little bit about like how this same way of building relationships amongst the ones that are already there can also serve us in creating bridges towards other communities. So I think that this is something that we were discussing the other day, or I don't know if it, I was talking about it, someone else, but the fact that, for example, Geo Chicas is a community within a community, like Jeffrey could tell, could talk a little bit about like hot being a community within a community and a community of communities. <laughs> the thing is that there there are other Geo Chicans instead of Geo Chicas in other open source communities. Like you have our ladies, you have Python chicks, you have Django girls. So something that we've done is create bridges with them as well and grow in a sense of building an even bigger and broader community. That's not only us, but we find partners and allies that are working towards the same goals as us outside of our own community. And I think it's all based on communicating and having dialogues and honest dialogues. Like, okay, we're Geo Chicas. We cannot do like a lot of things like because Geo Chicas is not only geographers or urbanists or architects, it also has people from social sciences like me. It also has people from, from the data world and more techie. But at some point we're like, okay, we want to have this kind of projects, but we don't have a programmer right now that could support us because we want to do it with Python. Don't ask me why we wanted to do it on Python. It's fine. We wanted to do it on Python. So what we do, <laughs> we reach out to those people, those women that are also part of the Python women-led community. So I think those for me and... I know my Hilco Madres are listening to me, Celine. She's as another founder of Geo Chicas, can keep me honest <laughs> and add something to the chat. But I think that's a big strength on like having the ability to communicate and to dialogue, not only with us, but with other communities. I can go next. Patrick, did you unmute yourself to say something? Oh, uh, I wanted to raise my hand after I saw you raise your hand, but I noticed that we're not monitoring hands anymore. So that's <laughs> a little bit. Please go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I'll no, go no, after no, you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I was um, going to mention when um, I was uh, doing these interviews with our sub community leaders, um, it became um, pretty evident pretty early on that some of these leaders are doing this work through their paid positions at their institutions, whereas some are doing it entirely in a volunteer capacity. And related to individuals that are doing it as part of their paid positions, those institutions are also, I think, providing additional resources in terms of like a Slack workspace or um, other platforms that those sub-communities are using for 
communications and for, for sharing resources with each other. And so um, that's been another thing that we've been talking about is so like, what is the role of the carpentries to support the sub communities that are emerging that may not have an in, may not have that institu institutional support um, for the various activities that they would like to do. Um, an example of that, uh, we have um, a sub-community in Japan who has their own Slack workspace. And I think starting September 1st, um, if you don't have a paid account with Slack, you'll lose all your messages or they'll be hidden from you, anything that's older than 90 days. And so they're kind of scrambling with, well, how do we, we need access to those messages, but they do not have funds for a paid account. And so working with them, to, to figure out, you know, a transition to whether it be an open source platform or how could they potentially use the workspace that's available through the Carpentries, for example, to support um, their specific needs. And so there's a lot of challenges there. And again, as I mentioned before, we currently don't know who all the subcommunities are out there. And related to that, we're not um, fully aware of which of those are being supported um, by um, uh, leaders that are in those. Those, uh, those paid positions at their institutions and something we're trying to learn a little bit more about so that we can move forward in the best way. Over to you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Uh, I, uh, I want to amplify what you just said about the paid versus uh, unpaid work. I mean, it's such an important discussion to have within the community, like how are we gonna operate? How, like what's the money flow going to look like and so forth. And uh, in the same way that we talked about the code of conduct, if you do it with 10 people or with 20 people, it's a pretty like short discussion, like maybe, you know, it'll, uh, it'll end up being like a one week discussion. But of course, if you already have hundreds of volunteers, then it's a month long discussion. I think it's uh, uh, very similar for the paid versus unpaid discussion. If you set up a, a long term plan, you know, maybe to transition from uh, from unpaid work to partially paid work and everybody knows and is on board or is like broadly aware, it's not going to blow up. But if it's decided uh, kind of in, a, in, in because there's a transition in the community, then of course it will be more controversial. And it's something that I've seen in, in different communities. Um, I wanted to talk uh, specifically about, you know, tools to make scaling more equitable, like just just uh, simple uh, simple tools. Um, I, one thing that we notice is that people don't understand time zones, and <laughs> it's actually like a huge problem that that we had early. Like we were a bunch of people, mostly on the east coast of the U.S., so like Eastern Eastern time. Everybody knows that Eastern time is 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 what it is, and um, and then you know for a little bit of time we uh, transitioned to UTC, and no one understood what uh, what UTC meant. Um, so it just made everything worse for everyone, basically. And so eventually we had a system where we said, you know, different time zones for different people and also would use calendar invites rather than, uh, or uh, using specially formatted dates, you know, in certain forums. Um, in uh, discourse, for instance, it's possible to put in a date that is UTC formatted and will be automatically translated to your local time zone. So you get to the meeting at the right time. These are silly things, but I mean, if you take <laughs> decisions uh, before, uh, if you take decisions and people don't show up because they're at the wrong time, man, it's, it's very silly, <laughs> uh, but I think it matters. Um, yep, that was my, uh, my contribution for tools. Can I say something real quick to like in response to Patrick? Um, at the Wikimedia Foundation, something that we have decided as part of our, like a way of making things more inclusive for other, because the Wikimedia Foundation is a globally distributed organization, right? We're around 66 different countries. So there's a lot of people, a lot of languages, a lot of time zones, <laughs> lots of them. So I think using, for example, UTC as a way in which all the people that are not based in San Francisco, for example, can understand where they like, okay, so before we started with this idea, everyone that wasn't based in San Francisco or in California or in that time zone needed to convert their time zones to that. 
So this is a little bit about when we were talking about practicing inconvenience, right? Why are we always inconvenient some and not others? So the UTC project for us has been something really great and also like rotating our meetings. Okay, so one month I'm going to wake up really early and someone's gonna have like a great day and the other month someone's gonna wake up really early and I'm gonna have a really great waking up late day. So I think that that it's important. And just going a little bit back to what we we're talking on paid versus unpaid work. This is a discussion that we've also had in OpenStreetMap based on the fact that many of these committees are also based in meritocracy, right? And when we talk about meritocracy, we talk about people contributing over and over and over and over to the projects. But what happens when you have, for example, women who are not only working, but are also taking care of their households. And then you have that double, like that double, I don't even know how to say it in English, like doble jornada, for those who speak Spanish, like you can translate it for me, thank you. <laughs> um, that makes it even harder for us to earn those merits and to become people who have like enough experience to be heard in our communities. So in that sense, understanding the fact of the how unfair it is to create spaces where like what's worth is how many edits you make rather than, for example, I haven't, I think I haven't mapped at a point on that map in a couple of years, but we've been working on community growth. And that's not, and, and, and that is not recognized by most of the community because what they want to see is that you reach to a thousand edits, right? So the paid versus unpaid plus practicing inconvenience, I think it's something that we can start critically thinking about. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Selina. I think I'll, I'll just also just add to that. I think, yeah, the, 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 the issue of paid and um, unpaid mapping uh, it comes up a lot um, uh, within OpenStreetMap, but it's also, like you have mentioned, they are very important also to recognize other types of contributions within the community. Um, yeah, so even within OpenStreetMap, it's not just about editing the map, people contribute in different ways. Um, yeah, it can be, uh, doing a training and someone is training um, uh, 50 other people has actually done a lot of work, even though they have not uh, made an edit on, on, onto the map, um, but also to um, maybe answer the question of like what uh, approaches or tactics we have used within the humanitarian open map to uh, make scaling more equitable. Uh, one approach we are taking now, really, if you follow the humanitarian open map, we are, are kind of decentralizing. Um, so we have now introduced regional hubs. Um, and, and, and I think it's just exactly for that particular purpose because the challenges for contributors in Africa are going to be very different from uh, challenges of contributors um, in, in, in Latin America. And when you try to put everyone in the same basket um, and you think you're solving the problem, then it's not, uh, doesn't really, one problem, one solution that works in Europe may not work in, in, in Africa. So yeah, we have created like regional hubs. Um, like I mentioned in my introduction, I work at the, uh, the hub for Eastern and Southern Africa, where I work as the community manager and uh, really trying to focus on uh, the, the challenges that uh, and growing the community in, that, uh, in, in the region uh, helps to make sure that at least, uh, you know, people who are not able to participate um, can also come and participate. Yeah, initially the, the, the way the humanitarian open map team was structured is that we had like working groups, um, you know, like the community working group, the technical working group, the activation working group, but still you'd find like within the working groups, not everyone is able to participate. Um, maybe the meeting is happening at, uh, you know, 5, uh, 5 p.m. Um, in, in the US, then how do you expect someone who lives in uh, you know, Uganda to be able to participate in that meeting? So it doesn't really work. So we have really uh, tried to uh, yeah, kind of decentralize the community through the regional hubs and 
we have like community support, but that community support is targeted for uh, a particular uh, region. And then in terms of tools, I think the other one that is important is also, um, I think, around localization. Are the tools accessible in, 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 in different languages? Um, so we have done also a lot of uh, translation, not only of the tools, uh, but also the, 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 um, the resources like training materials to uh, different languages so that at least people can be able to uh, participate in, in the language that they uh, they understand. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh man, there's so much to respond to um, from everyone, but I'll start with a couple of shout outs uh, in terms of time zones. Shout out to CarpentryCon, the humanitarian open street map team, a hot summit for coordinating across multiple time zones every year for your conference. It's really uh, something that we we look towards across many in, across the open ecosystem as examples of how in the world do you operate events all around the world and online. Um, I know there are many others and in the chat uh, for the audience, if there are other events that are great examples of how to uh, plan events across time zones and in inclusive ways, uh, please share that with all of us. Um, another shout out actually goes to, and this is very related to the question of paid and unpaid work, is that within the Turing Way, the Tools, Practices and Systems program, which kind of incubates uh, the Turing Way project within the Alan Turing Institute itself has, is in many ways an experiment in what it means to pay people to do research infrastructure and to be in research infrastructure roles and to you know, pay people to do open source work. Uh, and that's really, really important because it means that people's labor is remunerated. But something that's also happened as these roles have emerged is that it, it does inevitably kind of change uh, community dynamics, right? Um, in unpredictable ways, because then how does it alter the way in which, for example, our um, amazing, amazing translation and localization team has been started and is run entirely by volunteers um, across many different languages and are actually enabling the project to reach into many more spaces that wouldn't have been possible um, without them. And so this question of, you know, how do we remunerate? How do we how do we um, support and acknowledge and recognize people's work um, in all these different ways is something that we're very much trying to understand right now. And one of the, the ways that we've come to think about it or is very much evolving is trying to create systems of governance that enable this kind of decentralizing, that allow for localization, that enable these kind of feedback loops, but make the communication very explicit and very open so that it doesn't create uh, which sometimes can be inevitable, almost a class of um, class of people who kind of know everything while everyone else is kind of following along. Uh, maybe this is because I also read Joe Freeman's Tyranny of Structurelessness recently, it's really fresh in my mind, but she talked a lot about how, you know, with any so within any social movement or within any group, um, there eventually becomes the creation of what they call elites, which are kind of um, running running the project or running the program and kind of reinforcing their own roles within that group and not necessarily um, inevitably or accidentally leaving room for others to join the project, which is so key when you're talking about things like scaling and growth and creating new leaders within a community as well. Um, yeah, but if anyone has any reactions to that, I was just thinking about the term, right? Um, just like the Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I just, yeah, no I just wanted to, um, uh, so I, just one thing I wanted to add, um, and is, I think even before we talk about, um, you know, paid volunteers and unpaid volunteers, uh, are the ones that, you know, do this for full volunteer, are they acknowledged, are they recognized? Um, even, yeah, talking about feedback loops as we're talking about, uh, mentioning there, um, are people who are contributing, you know, uh, acknowledged, um, even receive a message and say, yeah, thank you for uh, contributing. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the field today, and today I, I met um, a student at the university who is uh, a, a youth mapper uh, who contributes uh, to, to our projects and does a lot of mapping. And she was saying, but I've never received any message saying um, <laughs> thank you for our mapping, you know, and this is something that can be automated um, where, you know, someone makes a contribution to maps and they receive a message in their inbox and say thank you for, for contributing. So I think, um, yeah, we always, we're always going to have uh, people who are, you know, paid within the community to, to get some work moving, 
And I think what is very important is just make sure that um, the people who are doing this compete on volunteer time, uh, their time is acknowledged and uh, they get feedback, even knowing like, does the contribution I make uh, make a change within the community? Because uh, people, for example, in OpenStreetMap, they do a lot of uh, mapping for humanitarian response, which basically also translates into saving lives. So to share such a story with um, a volunteer and say, yeah, the edit you made to, you know, to, um, to respond to this disaster has really helped to uh, save lives and uh, just make sure that the, the feedback loop is, is kind of closed there. Yeah. Something that has also come to mind actually that brings a lot of these questions together is the notion of tech debt. Um, I was wondering in these cycles of, you know, in acknowledge, acknowledging people's uh, contributions uh, to OpenStreetMap, for example, or to the Turing Way, for example, or to Wikipedia, or to join uh, the Neuromatch Academy, or to be a part of the Carpentries, um, how do you go about um, kind of keeping your internal infrastructures up to date? Um, to not allow for the accumulation of, of uh, projects that haven't been completed over time um, while enabling uh, growth. Oh, I love this question. Uh, it's uh, when you're running on enthusiasm, uh, oftentimes people love to make new things to showcase like I've created this, this proof of concept. And, uh, you know, in a, um, uh, in an enterprise, like, you, you know, when I was a software engineer at Google, like there was a lot of people that would maintain stuff and it's a bit of grunt work and it's not always fun, but you know, they're paid to do it and um, you know, eventually like get around to doing it. And I find that that cycle in, uh, in open source and in open science is not always there, you know, because people want to do fun things and their incentives are often to learn and you don't necessarily like to learn that much by maintaining things. And it's also like very unglamorous. Um, so it can happen a lot <laughs> that uh, you accumulate uh, technical debt. Um, so one thing that really helped us uh, early on is uh, to have somebody on board that had experience, you know, maintaining a larger ecosystem that had or accumulated some technical debt and dealing with that. Um, so we had, um, so very serendipitously, uh, one of the, um, uh, one of our core contributors uh, ended up being uh, the creator of Seaborn, uh, which is a Python package that I'm sure many of you are, are, are you know, knowledge about. It's, uh, it's part of the core, you know, data science ecosystem. And he had gone through this entire cycle of, of dealing with technical debt. So one thing we brought in early was um, continuous integration, right? So we had uh, an open science system that was really focused on, you know, creating uh, different educational materials to the Jupyter Notebook platform. And, but instead of just letting it be the kinds of usual chaos that it is in this environment, we created uh, some continuous integration, some scripts in order to take uh, some, um, that in order to be able to take this, uh, this code and, and verify that, you know, it maintains the style guide, uh, that it runs, that it doesn't have any bugs, that you know, there's the, there's the student version, there's the professor version, there's the TA version, et cetera, et cetera. So like a lot of this tooling came on board because we recognized that there was a need. We didn't really know how to do it, but thankfully we had somebody on board that we onboarded and, uh, and empowered to uh, implement this. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, reaching out to other communities, which have already figured out how to do this and, you know, absorbing them uh, essentially. Is uh, is one way to to uh, uh, to do it, um, but uh, uh, in any case, it's it's important to have like both uh, somebody that is technical that has that you know that knows how to to do it, and also like recognizes a community. You know, if you have like any sort of uh, either leadership or soft leadership, uh, in some ways to, that everybody kind of gets on board. It's like this is going to cost us a little bit, but trust me, like this is uh, it's going to be helpful in the end.
So um, we have a follow-up question to this. Um, are, are there approaches um, to scaling our growth that you are considering um, but have not tried yet? On the turnway side of things, we're just now in the process of creating a kind of series of categorized roles within uh, the pay team um, that take on different roles related to maintenance of the project. Uh, on one hand, to try and not to alleviate the, the tech debt, but also to give clarity and transparency to people's responsibilities and roles within the project. Um, when a project grows so quickly, often that ambiguity can be quite one, quite intimidating, but two, require a lot more time to understand the, the full extent of, um, in order to, to join fruitfully and to use your time well. And so we're kind of beginning that process of, of having these different categories and maybe along the lines of mentors, uh, reviewers, maintainers, to add clarity in that direction. I think something that we've been trying to do in GeoChicas is understanding a model of like distributed leadership um because at some point as i was saying before right we have a wide range of experience in in the group so we have people from again humanity social science blah 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 all the way to the tech world and also understanding that if i'm not there there are still other people that can still conduct like the projects and still can, and can still coordinate and so on and so on so for us trying to perceive that model as something that could work for us. It's been a big discussion. Also, because for example, we need, we have some projects that need to be maintained. So we have one person who's our technical coordinator, but she cannot be the only one doing it. We have some others that are our sys admins. And then we have the three of us who are like the core group of coordinators, the the, the <laughs> that we cannot, even if we are three people, we cannot do it by ourselves. So I think like understanding that, and it also helps other to have a much bigger sense of belonging to the community. What we don't wanna do is like, okay, so this is on you now. These are your responsibilities towards the group. See what you can do with that. So it's also a process of mentoring and being there for them as those who are new and this is something that we also do for example we have something that's called geo chica's take and it's something that we do for each big mapping event that we participate in like in the hot summit or the state of the map conference or the phosphor g conference that what we do is that we have a pre-event for all women and non-binary people participating in the event so they can get to know us. And for those who are like their first time participating in a mapping event, or if they went with a group from their work and they're the only women or the only non-binary person, um, for them to start creating like a safe network before they actually enter like the conference. And I think that's also been a really great example on how to create a um, much bigger sense of belonging and a much bigger sense of you're not alone in this and that has been reflected on how we can build leadership among other people in the group does that make sense if not please because i think that i was rambling <laughs> all around but i think it kind of makes sense right yeah for sure thanks silly um, yeah, uh, I also just want to share um, something that we are considering um, within OpenStreetMap and also the humanitarian OpenStreetMap is, is a community playbook. Um, so having a resource that, you know, is out there that um, anyone that is interested in, um, you know, either starting up an SM community, growing it, sustaining it, can use as, as a reference, you know, um, because most of the challenges that, you know, communities face, there are other people who have, you know, worked through the same challenges already and they have like 
uh, solutions. So um, to be able to capture that learning and knowledge um, and, and sharing it across uh, different groups, I think is very, uh, very important. Um, yeah, so I think that's something we, we are currently uh, trying to work on. Um, and, and hopefully once we have the community playbook, um, then yeah, it's not yet there, uh, Celine. Uh, but yeah, would, uh, yeah, it's the work in progress. You were part of some of the initial discussions and uh, yeah, it's something we are looking forward to that once it's available, then um, it can help uh, communities not only to start, but also to stay uh, sustainable. So if someone is looking um, around like, yeah, how do I, you know, uh, do uh, community engagement, how do I do, um, even run like a marathon. How, how how do I start? If I want like more diversity within the community, how do I handle this? Um, if I want to raise resources, um, create partnerships, how do I go around this? But also technical things like um, if I want to not be a project around open street map and I want good data quality, how do I go about it? So um, yeah, we hope like the community playbook would be something that encompasses several things that um, you know help answer some of these questions around community sustainability, maintenance, um, governance, and so on. I wanted to follow up to that comment um, too, Jeffrey, because that it's it's kind of um, interesting because I think we talked a lot about like it's difficult to have like a playbook or a guidebook or a um, handbook or whatever we would call it um, for these various roles. Um, and for um, the program that we're developing, we're we're starting with just um, developing a glossary. So at least we're starting as a community with a shared language when we're talking about various um, things. You know, um, uh, uh, it's just kind of like a first step. Um, but we also recently um, contracted um, an equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, expert to support um, development of what we're calling a toolkit of ideas, which is inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility strategies. And um, I was part of several kind of co-working sessions um, with Tara Robertson is, is who we were working with for this effort, um, but was involved with several conversation is even kind of a similar thing like, well, what is a toolkit? Like when you're thinking about something like that being, um, valuable in different scenarios and in different contexts when you're thinking about a global community. Um, is it a checklist? Is it, you know, what is it? And we started talking about like the power of stories and, and getting stories from different community members and maybe, you know, having a compilation of various stories that people could read and be inspired by, um, things that uh, people just need to be considering when they're, you know, um, leading various activities and programs. Um, and, you know, also providing that space for it to be um, a resource that can continuously be um, added to and, um, you know, and, and exactly what does that look like? Um, but we're actually um, going to be taking um, a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, that toolkit um, uh, Tara uh, um, pulled together, kind of a first draft of it. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about that during Carpentry Con. But I think that that's the challenge that continuously keeps coming up for us is like those different resources and how do we develop them in a way that they do offer that scaling that that needs to to happen how do you all um with this in mind then kind of as the number of people are involved in in the project maintain that sense of collective ownership or sense of belonging um, through either written materials like um, toolkits or handbooks. Because um, I will say that within the Turing Way, something that's been really amazing to see is that our record of contributors is um, really a place where people are able to, in their own time and in their own words and in their own way, um, write down their personal stories and experiences, not only in contributing to a project like the Turing Way, but also uh, maybe their experiences within open science or open scholarship more broadly. So creating these spaces that are not only um, for or within a single project, but are kind of collectively owned and collectively to collectively run. Um, 
um, yeah, if I can share what we are carrying, the approach we are taking with uh, um, the community playbook, like so initially what we did was also to um, get people who, um, you know, community leaders and ask them to share uh, their experiences. Um, because like, like I mentioned, I think like OpenStreetMap is really a community of communities. So there are so many different, uh, you know, groups and just asking people to come and share their experiences um, uh, is one way to kind of collect uh, this kind of information. And, and I think the more people that you involve, then that's where I think the ownership comes because they have contributed to this, uh, to building, like let us say it's a toolkit. Um, when people contribute, then they kind of um, get ownership uh, instead of, you know, just uh, getting a specialist and then building a tool and, you know, draw it out for the community to use, I think, uh, to kind of collaboratively um, build it, I think is the best approach uh, for ownership. And also it, the likelihood that it would, it would actually be used. Um, I think if people have invested time in contributing to uh, building the tool, uh, then also they, uh, they can use what is in there. Um, yeah, but also I think localization also making sure that at least uh, yeah, diff people who speak different languages also contribute um, instead of uh, contributing after the, the final product is out. So they also have to kind of be part of the process of, um, of, of building the tool, yeah. I'm also going to pass on Mike really quickly to Patrick as well, because in one of the planning sessions, you'd mentioned also how you'd customize your tech stack for the course, depending on the country that you were um, and the students that you were working with and the countries that they were based in. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So these are the kinds of decisions that impact a lot of uh, things inside of, of the project, right? So <clears throat> essentially, um, how do you collect uh, you know, money from students and how do you reuse it uh, down the line in order to maintain the sustainability of the whole operation. And one of the things that, that we realized pretty early on is that, well, okay, based on our signups, we have many students from, uh, from North America and Europe and Australia. Um, and probably, I think in our first year, it was 55% or something. Um, but we also had many students from China and from India and from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, in Central America. And just the uh, standard of living is completely different. So if we asked $100 from each student, it was a completely different burden for somebody that lives in Switzerland compared to somebody that lives in India, for instance. So we went back and said like, okay, well, this is not cool, but maybe we just, you know, tell the students, uh, hey, if you can't afford it, just, you know, just don't send us the money. It's totally fine. And, um, and you know, we had a lot of internal, internal discussions. Is this okay? Like, is this the right kind of framing that we want to give to the, to, to, to the students? And we ended up saying like, well, no, because it, it still feels like maybe there will be people that can't really afford it, but will feel a kind of a social obligation to, to give the money and will end up like putting themselves in, you know, in, in, in silly situations like, you know, foregoing, putting gas in the car, uh, you know, for a week or something, you know, not being able to do groceries like in a, because they really want to pay the tuition because they feel this is an important project. And like, and in our view, it was like, well, this is kind of silly. Like we want, you know, rich people from rich countries to pay for it and to, to bankroll uh, students in, in traditionally less represented parts of the world. So we ended up uh, doing scaling. Um, so, which was kind of a big effort. I think in the first year was a hundred dollars for if you had, um, I think we might've used uh, uh, GDP per inhabitant as the, uh, as the metric, you know, in order to create these different classes. So if it, if it was like $20,000 and up, you would have the full tuition. It was, I think, $70 tuition for people between 10,000 and 20,000. And between 5,000 and 10,000, it might have been like 30 bucks. And then anything that was below that was, uh, was free by default. And so I think that that nipped a lot of these uh, uh, concerns uh, uh, 
because you know it was accessible by default uh, people still had the occasion to say like i can't actually afford this because of my particular situation but it didn't feel like you know those people that where hundred dollars was like a lot of money, you know, would, would place themselves in, in kind of these uh, these silly situations. We had like this anchoring um, aspect to it. And what was important after the fact, like, did it work? <laughs> right. It's so important to actually evaluate when you have like these great ideas, and a lot of them don't actually work. Right. So, uh, so in that case, how we evaluated it is uh, we calculated the amount of people that um, that forwent the uh, uh, that that for when this uh, this tuition and it was about equal in each of our income classes. Of course, we would expect that um, if we had if it was too expensive, for instance, for uh, people in a certain income bracket, then uh, a lot of them would have said, "I can't afford it." Right. So if it was about equal in each of these uh, in each of these brackets, we figured, well, this is like about the right balance. And so I think more than 80% of our income came from, uh, from people um, in, uh, in high income countries uh, where you know, the tuition was you know, relatively reasonable, I think. Uh, that was very important, of course, to set up this, this system of uh, where you know, the school is, is inclusive by default. Realizing that we only, how in the world do we only have 15 more minutes? I feel like our conversation could go on for far longer. And there are so many, so many different topics that we brought up today. Um, I guess maybe before our final question that we'd had for you all, we're actually gonna bring in some questions from the, um, from the Q and A and from the Padlet that people have been asking, which are very, very interesting. Which is like, so the first being, how do you track or understand a community of communities in the first place? How have you all um, been able to keep track or try to keep track of those communities of communities? And how do you improve the connections between them and identify where connections may or may not be present or may or may not be robust? Go for it, Alicia. Yeah, so we haven't done this yet, but we're um, developing kind of a, a evaluation plan um, around the program that we're currently in the process of developing. Um, and kind of related to that, we're we're planning on um, uh, starting a subcommunity registry. I mentioned that we currently don't know which subcommunities we have there out there, and so this will be a way that we can um, make those subcommunities more visible, not just to ourselves, so we can better support them, but for to our broader community, um, so that they can um, better connect with each other. Um, we're also looking at starting to do an annual survey, like a community survey, um, so that we can continuously get the feedback from the community to see how we might want to modify things moving forward. Um, again, based on um, our core values as a community, making sure we are moving things forward in the best possible way and providing that space to, um, especially if someone would like to um, remain anonymous to, to provide feedback on um, ways they, they see us needing to change direction or what they would like for us to be doing. Um, so that hasn't been fully developed, but happy to chat with anyone about how we've been doing that and what metrics we've been looking at and that kind of thing, but it hasn't been fully implemented yet. I think that for us in Geo Chicas, not in the open stream up community, like in the broader sense of the community, but in Geo Chicas, it's kind of been the other way around. So we identify an issue in the community. So we started creating this sub-community. So we are the sub-community of the main community. And I think that for us, it's been different in the sense that there was this problem about representation and inclusivity. So what we saw, it was the opportunity to create something for people to come to us rather than we tracking others. But as I was saying earlier today, what we are doing actually, it's like having active communications and approaches to finding other groups that are just like the same as us. I think that's how we have been, 
identifying those other allies that can participate in the community. And I think like the last time we did, we, we took a group decision on how we could scale and reach out to others. Um, the thing is that Geochica started off as from a really political decision that we wanted it to be a Spanish speaking group. Because in the open stream of community, the like the general language, as in many of other open source communities or in the tech world, like hello, I'm speaking in English right now. Um, it's English, right? So for us, it was a really political decision to have a space where women and non-binary people could feel comfortable enough to discuss their own issues in their own language. And we say their own language because that's like we started off in Latin America. So for us it was Spanish. Could have been some other language, right? If it was to be in Asia, like in China or something. Um, but we decided to create a group in English. So we have like a Geo Chicas chapter in English that has supported a lot of other people that want to participate in our project. So again, like for us, it's been the other way around. Like we were like the opportunity for them to come and gather rather than us having to track them down to find them. Does that make sense? <laughs> and I guess that the question that comes from that is then as a community within these community of communities, would you actually want to be tracked down or kept track of? Um, I think that's something that we were like the, the next a project that we, it's still on under discussion is that at least in Latin America, we don't have like an inventory of other groups, like an updated inventory of other groups that are not necessarily within the open stream of community or the OSGEO community, but they are working with anti-colonial feminist mapping, anti-colonial practices from academia, from activism, from many other many other communities and places. So we were trying to see how we could map those other groups that are not necessarily in the tech world, but that could be allies. That's something. And for example, there's a lot of pro knowledge production and like intellectual production going on about feminist geographies, feminist cartographies and so on and so on. But there's also not an inventory or like a place where you can go and find everything that's being produced in the region. So at the same time, we're also looking forward constantly to like global North production. Like what are the geographers in the United States like writing about? What are the geographers in Europe writing about? Because it's easier to find that kind of information. But what happens with all the information and production that's being produced here in the region? So that's something that we're discussing. And I think it would open up the community to another community that's not our brother community. Does that make sense? Like community, community and community. <laughs> but yeah, it's something that we're discussing. Yeah, and, and to add on that, uh, so I think um, when it comes to, you know, communities of communities, I think uh, like Anna, you have mentioned there, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, um, all groups want to be tracked, you know, um, because when you do that, then it can also uh, kind of cause kind of assimilation uh, where, you know, everyone who you count other groups or other communities as your community, uh, whereas they may want to just feel like yeah, we are, we are an independent community within the, uh, within the wider community. Um, so I, I think for me, what is important is making sure, uh, like what we are doing with at humanitarian open street map is just to uh, enable participation. Um, uh, is the community uh, kind of diverse enough? Are there uh, many people that are, are, you know, participating from the different parts of the world? Doesn't matter whether they, um, we don't have to call them uh, like the hot community, like not everyone who comes and uses the hot tools um, is part of the whole community. There are some groups, you know, who use our tools and they are mapping for different uh, reasons. Um, and I think that is important uh, to make sure that at least, at least we are not seeing who is participating, who is contributing, and also trying to reach out to groups who are not maybe um, represented and just 
helping them to be able to participate um, without necessarily tracking them. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Um, yeah, not everyone would want to be uh, tracked. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so when it comes to tracking, you know, if it is the case that, uh, you know, we have some goals as a, as a community, uh, I think it's, it's important to set up the, uh, the instrumentation, the measurement, like pretty early on. Uh, I'm sure that many of you in your communities uh, have had uh, trouble just like keeping track of who's actually in the community, who's volunteering, who's uh, an inactive contributor, who's just in the Slack and kind of um, just monitoring rather than, than, than actively participating. Um, so setting up like good instrumentation and measurement early, I, I think is, is important. So one simple thing is if you're doing a multi-year project, you know, making sure that your questions, uh, your surveys, for instance, that you send out, uh, as uh, Alicia mentioned, have compatible questions so that you can track the evolution of your community as a function of time. Um, so, you know, for instance, I, I can tell you that uh, our reach as uh, in, in low income countries has uh, grown from 2020 to 2021 to 2022. So that I think in the first year was something like 30% of people of students came in from low income countries and now it's 45%. Well, if we had changed the categories or just like the boundary of what's considered a, a low income country or, you know, there, there could have been like a lot of different changes in the survey. Uh, that would have made that measurement like not uh, actually meaningful. So uh, designing these these measurements and uh, that, that instrumentation early on and thinking about it thoroughly and just being very diligent about it is, uh, is super important. I know that surveys oftentimes are designed like kind of last minute and, uh, you know, and, and it certainly happened that I've sent out surveys and you get results which are kind of muddied by the lack of design. Um, and I think the super important thing also about uh, doing surveys and, and tracking is uh, have a closed loop. So if you ask questions, just post the answers like ASAP. Um, in one case, we, uh, we had like daily like satisfaction surveys to see like how the students were, were feeling. And we would get the surveys at 6 p.m. And by 8 a.m. the next day, the results would be posted. So, and we would have like action items to say to the students, like, here's what we're going to do to make this better. Okay, you don't feel, you know, comfortable like sharing with, with your TA house, here's how we're going to change that interaction. We're going to give you the tools to, to make it happen. Otherwise, if you send out a survey and you um, give the results like six months later, like <laughs> your participation rates are going to go like down to, to very, very low. Um, so we've had some surveys in some cases where we had 70%, 80% participation rates. I mean, I'm used to like 4% <laughs> survey participation rates in the, in the broader world. So yeah, just closing that loop and making it like essentially instant, super important. And I have a follow-up question to Patrick on this. we be super rapid and then I'll... Super quick. Do you think that by posting the results like so fast, that's how you engage people to continue participating in the in in the surveys? And second, because fast, what kind of demographic um, did you like collect any kind of demographic data? And how do you do that? Like, how do you secure like people's like privacy and all that? Yeah, so one, uh, absolutely. It's just a hunch. I don't have any data on that, but I feel like if I'm going to do something and then I never hear about it, which is 99% of the surveys that I fill out. And I, I'm a data scientist and statistician by training. So like, I love surveys. I'll answer all of them. But like 99% of the time, I never hear back from them. And it's very frustrating, you know? I, I want people to actually like use these and gain insights and do stuff about it. Um, so I figured, well, in our org, we should, we should actually like read the answers and, and you know change how we operate based on them and give people the feedback early. I have no evidence that it's true, but I mean it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> the the second question, there's always uh, these questions. I mean, um, so uh, many of you that are not in the U.S. like so there, there's th these questions that we had about how should we gather demographic information. 
So um, we're a US-based uh, 501c3, and for a lot of grants, for instance, for the NSF, the NIH, and so forth, they really care about uh, demographics as defined by the American system, which is, don't even, even get me started about like, uh, the, <laughs> about like whether these are meaningful categories, but, um, uh, you know, there's one category which is basically race, uh, so like uh, Caucasian slash white uh, of African descent and Middle Eastern. It, it's a bit of a hodgepodge, uh, you know, honestly, these categories have existed for a very long time and, you know, probably not updated to what we would consider um, different ethnic communities. And then there's a, a Latino, non-Latino. Um, which is another category, which is somehow orthogonal to the other one. It's very confusing. Um, these categories are probably meaningful for people in the U.S. I know that you know I, I was uh, uh, you know mentioning that I met my wife, who's uh, Central American in in the U.S. And the first time that she encountered these kinds of form for the NIH, she was like, "What?" <laughs> um, but uh, as uh, U.S. citizens, that uh, can. Uh, makes sense and was necessary for us to gather this information for the NIH and, and the NSF. So you have to have a, a conversation with a new community like, are we okay with these kinds of categories? Because they're very important for fundraising, but at the same time, like, you know, <laughs> they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty baseless, essentially. So and what's more important, having money in the bank or like having this argument? Uh, and well, should we send it out to everyone? Should like for somebody in France, for instance, uh, those categories are what, like these are very different, um, there would be very different categories that people would identify themselves with. So is it meaningful to do that? So we, we had a lot of back and forth, um, you know, trade-offs. Ah, yeah, actually you can't ask for in France. That's absolutely true. Yeah, so how do you deal with that? It was, it was a big discussion. I can't believe we have two minutes left. I feel like there, every single time I've interluded, I feel like we're just time is zooming by. But this is actually a really great segue into a question that can't be answered due to lack of time. Um, but would love if you all have answers that you could write into the pad. Um, is actually a question about you know with these incentive structures that are around us, um, these things like surveys or. Um, or data reporting, et cetera, that we need to have in order to receive things like funding. Um, with these structures in place, you know, how, when do you intentionally, and I'm reading through this question that was not the wording of the question itself, it asks, when do you intentionally move away from growth slash scaling for the sake of improving culture slash relationality in a community? Um, that would be really interesting to hear um, all of your answers about that. Um, maybe in a written form. Um, but given that we're actually one minute out of time, maybe for a very quick uh, Zoom run through all of us, maybe what does the future hold for, the, for you all in your community? Um, are you scaling? Are you growing? How are you thinking about scaling? What does the future hold? And we'll maybe take a minute or two to do so and do a really rapid fire um, before we have to close the room. I can quickly go first. I've talked about about the program already a lot about the program we're developing, but I would love to continue the conversation with others that are doing this work because I think it's very challenging. So um, I'll add my email address into the chat. If you'd be interested in having ongoing conversations about the work you're doing in this space, I would love to be part of that. Um, so that's that's what I would say. I'll pass it to Sally. I think that for us, the future is about maybe stop scaling a little bit and start rethinking what we're doing. Like that's our future and how we're going to, we started off with analyzing what was happening in the community. Now that it's been five years, what is it that we're actually going to be doing now? That's our future. I'll pass it over to Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's hard to you know to think about scaling uh, without thinking about uh, you know achieving diversity and inclusion. Um, I think 
for us, uh, scaling can only be good if there is um, less barriers to participation. It's not an open community, really, if uh, not everyone can participate. So uh, really thinking about, yeah, what are the barriers to participation and identifying those and trying to lower them as much as possible. Um, yeah, because it may count the numbers, but if you don't look at, you know, where are people coming from, then, um, yeah, it's not enough. So I think as we look at scaling, also look at diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Over to um, Patrick. Thank you. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for uh, for inviting me. This was a super interesting discussion. I think for um, for our purposes, for uh, for Neuromag Academy, we're continuing to grow. We're adding more courses. Um, a big milestone this year was uh, attaining uh, sustainability in terms of uh, you know outpouring money versus uh, income, so that we're not so reliant on on sponsorships. Um, so a huge. Uh, a huge milestone to, to really happen. And we've also hired a CEO. Um, and so we have our first, you know, paid, uh, paid contributors. And that's going to allow us to, to scale in the future and to make, you know, this innovation in, in open science and education possible for years to come. So I'm very excited about the future. This definitely feels like a conversation that would require a follow-up and many other follow-ups because what's so interesting about hearing from all of your experiences is how much, in many ways, our conversation has been a series of finding shared language to describe different or similar processes, but also maybe entirely different approaches as well. And maybe the real question is, how do we bridge across all of these different approaches um, and ways of thinking through these issues of scale and growth? Um, it really very much feels like a part one of a much longer conversation, but um, wish you all the best. and. Thank you so much for giving part of your Friday um, to this fireside chat. And um, stay tuned for our next one at the end of August. And as I said at the beginning of the call, we'll be leaving this room open for anyone that would like to ask any questions. We'll stop the recording um, so that people will be able to engage in the way that they would like. But thank you again for giving us your time. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>